Hi traders, welcome to Market Outlook, Trends, Risk Events and Trade Setups brought to you by Vantage Markets. This is a weekly webinar where we focus on the key events and themes, both fundamental and technical driving markets at the moment. Whilst I just let you have a look at the disclaimer, I'll just run run through as usual uh what we hope to get through uh in the next 40 minutes or so uh we'll uh, check out how markets are shaping up this week um and we'll look at uh stocks uh in the us uh also look at the aussie index as well the asx 200 as well quite interesting uh as well as um having a a brief uh preview um look at earnings at the moment big week ahead for earnings mega cap tech stocks especially uh we'll briefly review uh, some of the uh, market movers from last week and then we'll check out all the uh the main risk events that we see this week there's the three major central banks of course the fed the ecb and the bank of england meeting uh with their rate decisions uh and then also we get a lot of top tier um macroeconomic data uh, probably the most important will be the non-farm payroll. We also get uh, Eurozone CPI as well. Okay, I'll just bring up a chart of uh, year-to-date FX uh, performance-wise that you can see. Uh, we brought that up last week, actually, and there's been uh, no changes, actually, from top to bottom. Uh, the Aussie leading the way and has extended its gains against the Auss uh, the um, US dollar uh, and then sterling, Kiwi, all of these currencies, uh, big plays on um, China, certainly uh, sterling, uh, just on risk sentiment in general, of course, Aussie and Kiwi, definitely a Chinese story. Uh, also the Eurozone as well as uh, these falling gas prices as well, uh, helping uh, in terms of trade in the region. So um, no change in the um, the uh, major currencies and how they're faring, but certainly the dollar is still very weak and struggling. Uh, of course, it's a pivotal week. A week uh, like very few others, really, in, in recent memory, especially uh, mentioned the three central banks, also lots of data releases. Um, and then obviously these earnings um, from uh, some of the major tech companies, which will start uh, to get rolling in uh, the middle part of the week. Uh, the dollar really started um, this week in a very narrow range, actually, uh, not far from the lows of the year. Of course, U.S. Treasury yields have picked up actually off their lows. 10-year uh, yield now above 3.5%, but generally uh, that 10-year Treasury yield oscillating around that 3.5% mark for the time being. Um, the Asian session actually saw a swoon in risk sentiment for the first time in weeks um, as China and Chinese mainland markets sold off sharply after a gap opening higher in, the, in their first session, obviously since the, the Lunar New Year, since the long holiday closure. That uh, contrasted with the solid closes in the US on Friday uh, as financial conditions continue to ease aggressively ahead, of course, of Wednesday's FOMC meeting. Uh, we mentioned last week that the broad theme was around the global economic cycle being at uh, a key juncture, investors trying to weigh up the options between uh, whether we get a soft landing or a recession. Um, U.S. housing data, survey data has been weak for some months now, and then it's kind of the real economic data that is starting to show uh, a downturn as well. Um, the flip side to this is, of course, globally has been the most positive story around uh, the rest of the world. China, of course, reopening very positive, um, uh, uh, very uh, positive yeah, thoughts on how China reopens and obviously its impact on uh, positive impact on economic activity, um, certainly seen supporting global growth. And then we've got, as we mentioned already, lower energy prices, of course, meaning an improved uh, European growth prospects. Um, they're really consensus ideas now. Um, and along with the Fed, which is expected to acknowledge easing price pressures and end its tightening cycle soon. Um, certainly then the events this week will shape these themes um, and uh, certainly then have an impact on um, markets 
price action uh, and um, what we see going forward. For equities, just pull up a chart. First of all, uh, um, the SP 500. Uh, well, last week, um, yeah, S&P edged up. Uh, we can see just around, um, rounded up 0.3% on Friday. And as that 100 was up uh, close to 1% on Friday, that brought those benchmarks to 4.7% uh, on the week, 2.5% for the S&P. Uh, Tesla led the charge high with an 11% gain on Friday, um, extending its post-quarter results rally really by adding double digit gains actually for a second straight session. Uh, that's after Elon Musk signals strong demand for um, the uh, Teslas. Um, probably then for um, uh, this current bullish narrative to continue, um, uh, it very much depends certainly on the Fed only hiking by a quarter of a basis point. Uh, and then indicating, as we said, that the end of the tightening cycle is closer uh and certainly there's not too much pushback and we'll look at this in a lot more detail shortly uh but secondly secondly for equities then um company results are our key as of uh friday 27th of jan 29 percent of the s p 500 companies had reported 41 percent of those had beaten street estimates and uh, just a similar number were in line uh, IT, healthcare and materials had the highest percentage of companies reporting positive surprises. Uh, and then this week we get another 31% of S&P 500 companies reporting um, those major tech earnings being from Meta. Uh, that's uh, the parent of Facebook, of course, then Apple, Amazon, and then Alphabet as well uh, later in the week. Um, optimistic outlooks really are needed from these companies, especially. Uh, but if we see a sort of margin squeeze, damper outlooks, a bit like uh, how we uh, or what we heard from Microsoft then last week, uh, certainly there could be a, a downturn in stocks. We also probably need to uh, remember that uh, we have seen big rebounds in um, Apple, for example, up 12%, Amazon 21%. Uh, while the S&P and the NASDAQ are up around 13% from uh, those recent lows in November. Um, if we just look at the charts, then we can see now the S&P 500. Those of you who've been following us, of course, uh, and markets in general, of course, we know about the 200-day moving average. Um, S&P pushed above that last week. We can see five solid days above that key indicator. We've also got that long-term trend line which I had acted as resistance that you can see there again uh, on, on uh, numerous occasions over the last few months uh, uh, before the top of the year, obviously last year, sorry, uh, this time last year. And we've just got that break above it now, which is um, key, actually it looks uh, very strong on the weekly, actually. And then on the daily, we can see, yeah, we pushed above there and we're pushing towards these um, December pivot highs around 4,100. Uh, if we get above that, then the next highs, we see September highs at 41.19 and then the late August highs around 4,200 here. So um, if we can sustain this positive breakout, really positive push above uh, that that key sort of region around 4,000, then potentially, yeah, we, we're looking 4,100, 4,200 then after that. Uh, for the NASDAQ, um, Again, we said it had catching up to do. Um, it's broken that long-term trend line resistance. So that becomes support. Uh, and then the 200-day moving average as well, Pierce, last week, late last week, you can see that hangs around 12,000. Um, and the uh, mid-December high of 12,166, we're bang on that now, really, the close from Friday. So uh, we can see actually futures are headed lower. Um, down 1.33%, you can see here. Um, so then settling back towards that uh, key 12,000 level, looks like, which is a 200 day moving average. And we're sort of then, if we do roll back, we're sort of back into this sort of November, December range trading. Uh, critical levels, obviously, lots of risk events to look out for. Um, 
I did mention we'd look at the ASX 200. Uh, this is obviously the Aussie's key index. Um, it's outperforming the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ at the moment. Gains from the September lows around 16%. Uh, whilst it's also recording its biggest monthly gains since November 2020. It's up around 6.18%, I think. So... Um, as we said, Australia's market, if we just look on the weekly, you can see now we're, we're heading towards, we're in amongst the noise now, really. Uh, be really key whether we can break above sort of 7,600 or so. We're not there yet. Uh, a key resistance, massive resistance, really, for the ASX 200. Um, but certainly it's, a, it's an investment proxy, of course, on China's reopening as well as also being then a dividend and commodity play. And we know that commodities are um, really balancing hard uh, on the China story. Um, and then this certainly outperformance of the ASX of commodities potentially then all to do with, um, or sorry, the ASX, ASX certainly uh, outperformances to do with that um, continuing rebound in <clears throat> materials such as iron ore, um, copper, aluminium, as well as then financial companies, uh, which are high in the list, uh, and they benefit certainly from higher uh, interest rates. Okay, uh, we shall go now to um, last week's data, actually. Um, firstly, just briefly, continuing the Aussie theme, actually. Um, important data we got from uh, the latest inflation figures for December. That really put the risk of another 25 basis point rate hike from the RBA on the table for February 7. So that's next week. Uh, not only that, but there's really speculation that policymakers may follow that up with, uh, with probably another one or two rate hikes in the coming months. Um, December CPI, that rose to 8.4%. Um, uh, and then um, that dragged Q4 headline CPI inflation up to a 32-year high at 7.8% from 7.3% in the previous quarter. Um, the RBA does expect or had expected inflation to end last year in the ballpark of 8%. Um, but certainly Australian money markets, they discounted um, before the release, actually about a coin toss, coin toss chance of another 25 basis point in Feb. So a 50% chance that's now gone to around 80% now for that meeting next week. Uh, and the Aussie dollar subsequently has regained that position, as we showed you, of the best performing G10 currency this year. Um just days actually after the soft and expected um, labour report out of Australia, which kind of knocked it slightly from its podium. Um, following on with the ASX, actually the Aussie is still expected to perform well through this year against the basket of um, its other major peers. Um, and certainly we can see on the chart then the Aussie dollar chart, this big bounce from sort of those lows actually, uh, mid-October, if you remember, below 62. We're now up above 70. Uh, we have uh, on the weekly chart, this is the 200-week moving average, uh, which we're now just above, uh, which is at 70, 71. Uh, we're sitting on it, really. Um, and then we have resistance above, which is the 100-week moving average is at 71, 64. If we drop down to the Daily, you can see actually, sorry, just going back to that weekly, you can see, sorry, this FIB level of the um, 2022 decline. So uh, the 61.8 is at 70.91. So just above where we are now. So that'll act as resistance. And then uh, sort of below there, we've got the halfway point at 69.15. Um but you can see we're sort of also then with these August highs, the August high being 71.36. So haven't quite reached those. Uh, we did get above that last week. You can see 71.42 last week's high, but just rolling over for the time being. Uh, also last week, we had uh, Eurozone PMIs. 
that was the main economic story really out of the eurozone both uh, manufacturing and services beat expectations and that then lifted the composite pmi to 50.2 that was actually the first reading north of the boom or bust level remember 50 denotes above 50 expansion below contraction um so that was the first time above 50 since june of last year in fact um, and improvements um, supported by rising confidence for activity in the next 12 months. Uh, and that's also caused companies to keep hiring. Uh, and just on this, sort of there's this contrast, of course, uh, between rises of input prices, which are now slowing due to easing pressure from energy prices, and then also um, sort of uh, reduced distortions, if you like, in supply chains. Uh, but then on the other side, we have output prices, which continue to rise at elevated prices. Uh, but all in all, the combination is sort of better activity with higher output prices. Really, that does support ECB guidance to continue tightening policy. And um, we'll look at that in more detail shortly. Uh, finally, last week, we also had the Bank of Canada meeting. They raised rates by 25 basis points to four and a half percent. Uh, but provided the economy and inflation evolves in line with the bank's outlook, then uh, the Bank of Canada, they do expect to hold uh, policy rates there. Um, growth has been more resilient. The economy remains in excess demand. Um, but um, GDP, well, it's expected to expand about 1% this year, 2% next. And that's kind of little change from their October forecast. Um, but um, um, the rate hiking cycle that we have seen um, certainly been very aggressive front loading. And that's now um, meant um, we've, we have now get restrictive monetary policy. That's really filtering through, especially in household spending and the housing market. Uh, and it kind of means the overall activity slowdown will allow then supply to catch up with demand. Um so uh, sort of balancing out for the Bank of Canada, um, inflation um, is um, declining. It declined in December to 6.3%. And then the three-month measure of core inflation has come down as well, um, suggesting it has peaked. Um, so it's really this pause announcement that everybody was expecting. It did, did, really, um, uh, did really go through with that. Um, so really kind of not too many major surprises. Uh, a dovish hike really is kind of uh, what many called it. Um, markets were pricing in that 4.5% terminal rate, have been for some time. Um, uh, but interestingly, uh, the um, money markets still expect 50 basis points of rate cuts by the end of this year. And that kind of hasn't changed since before the decision, actually. Um the Canadian dollar, well, it's sort of knee-jerk reaction um, before sort of pairing losses to um, uh, in dollar CAD around sort of 133 area. Um, kind of interesting as well, I think, for the, um, the decision to pause, it kind of perhaps uh, highlighted potentially also what may happen in the U.S. Uh, yield, uh, U.S. yields did tick modestly lower um, after the decision, uh, and it kind of weighed on the dollar um, potentially, as we said, if the Fed is on the verge of adopting a similar position. Um, and it all sort of fits in with the narrative of easing price pressures in a, a mild, potentially a mild, more mild U.S. recession. Um, for dollar CAD, anyway, uh, it's kind of a this clear lack of dyna dynamism in price action, really. Uh, that's slowing um, the loony progress, really, after um, easing uh, below support around 133.50 earlier in the week. And you can see we just moved below there, also below that sort of uh, rising trend line. So that now acts as resistance. 133.52, you can see a FIB level we've drawn in there. That acts as uh, initial resistance and then potentially then support around sort of 132 or so um, and the November lows. Um, but sort of really waiting for the catalyst, waiting for the Fed and um, non-farm payroll as well on Friday. Okay, to this week's main events. Um, I'll just pull up something here that we have 
on the charts, which is uh, financial easing conditions. I'll get into that. But for the Fed, um, FOMC meeting Wednesday. So consensus expects uh, policymakers to downshift again. So lifting its um, to, uh, Fed funds target rate uh, to, or, or sorry, by 25 basis points to four and a half to four and three quarter percent. Uh, Fed speakers have broadly guided for all this smaller hike at this meeting. Um, expectations of a soft landing. So remember that is, I've talked about it a lot, but that is, of course, raising rates enough to stamp out inflation, but not enough to push uh, the US into recession. So uh, expectations of a soft landing have picked up since the start of the year, of course, we've mentioned uh, relative to, if you think about the rising recession bet bets that we saw in the second half of last year. Meanwhile, inflation, of course, has been on a steady downtrend in the last six months, which has certainly allowed the Fed to downshift to uh, the 50 basis point rate hike we saw in December. And that came, of course, after four straight hikes of 75 basis points uh, before that. Uh, so headline inflation, that's fallen from 9.1% to 6.5% uh, in December, that was. But it's, of course, still way above the Fed's 2% target. Uh, with economic data still remaining slightly volatile, there's some reason to believe possibly uh, that T Powell may be aiming to lengthen the um, hiking cycle in order to buy more time to assess both the incoming data and then the impact of uh, the Fed's previous aggressive front loading rate hikes. Um, that certainly warrants this 25 basis point hike. Uh, it's been um, nailed on by markets now for uh, a week or so, at least, if not longer. Um, is there a risk factor that they go 50 basis points? Um, well, the biggest risk factor is the chart here, is this easing in financial conditions. Um, the easiest they've been since April 2022. Um and um, really where the Fed, um, when actually the Fed started its tightening cycle. Um, so the easing of these financial conditions, that means it kind of blocks um, the effective transmission of monetary policy. And then it feeds the risk that inflation might come back for a second time. So that um, you might hear about easing financial conditions a lot more. Uh, and this is basically the issue, which uh, uh, we've talked about it before, but just this chart shows it nicely um, and it goes against really what the Fed is trying to achieve uh, by obviously slowing demand um, enough um, to not cause obviously a harder landing, but some kind of soft landing. And that's really where uh, risk markets are priced for uh, this view. Uh, we mentioned a couple of those consensus views as well earlier. Uh, money market pricing then um, and commentary from Fed officials uh, has been diverging further out. So away from this meeting, policymakers kind of been reticent to get into discussions about when the central bank will cut rates. Uh, and really, they are instead focusing on this still high inflation levels. Uh, and for historical context, uh, we've actually mentioned this before, the Fed has tended to hold rates at neutral for between three to 15 months, while the average is around six and a half months. Uh, but money markets are pricing in rate cuts at the end of this year as the economy slows. Um, so while the Fed will likely continue its course until its inflation goals are more clearly in sight, investors, on the other hand, are debating the level that rates will peak and how long then they'll be held at the terminal rate. And this will be potentially a key question for Fed Chair Powell in his press conference. He's obviously slowing, <coughs> excuse me, slowing the rate hike pace, the rate hike pace. Um, but then the question is, where will that terminate terminal rate end up? Uh, the markets imply that will be below 5%, whereas, uh, or that is more dovish certainly than uh, that penciled in, that peak rate above 5% by officials in their December dot plot, if you remember the economic project projections. Um, so does Chair Powell push against that, push against the market's doviceness 
and these looser financial conditions. That probably is probably pretty much expected now. So any deviation from that, if he doesn't, if he's more constructive, then certainly that will probably push the dollar lower, push risk assets, stocks higher. Um, uh, but if he's then uh, more aggressive, more uh, hawkish, then uh, obviously the flip side sees the dollar go bid, potentially off its lows and um, the um, stocks or the rally risk rally turn lower. Um, we can just see, actually, we've got a dollar chart uh, before we look at DXY. Uh, we can see then this rebound in um, uh, some of the peers, some of the um, dollar peers, if you like. Uh, the euro, of course, sterling, yen, all rebounding strongly against the dollar, um, um, picking up the pace certainly this year as well. Uh, and if we just look at the DXY, um, which is obviously the dollar index against uh, six of its major peers, um, well, that's fallen one and a half percent this month already. Um, it's looking on track to record its fourth monthly decline, which you can see here. That hasn't happened since. Where do we go back to? Uh, sort of uh, mid 2020, really, for four months of decline, straight declines, that is. Uh, so you can see that strongly there, those four months there. And we're now actually trading at levels last seen in May, well, June may 2022 so last year um if we just look at the weekly uh it really looks like bearish consolidation these last few weeks doesn't it um trend is down uh and the more we track sideways then generally uh, or historically then uh we move break down in line with the dominant trend which is for lower prices um if we look on the daily then uh yeah still oscillating around sort of uh, just below 102 potentially if we do go lower then um, we're looking at sort of uh, probably big figures 101 and then 100 potentially um, with uh, yeah you can see support around those may lows then 101 43 uh, 101 probably initial support uh, but the more we track sideways we think you kind of think uh Prices will then break down in line with the dominant trend. Fascinating then. Um, a juncture for the DXY, um, especially. Uh, so that's the Fed. That's on Wednesday. Uh, that's at um, uh, Wednesday evening, UK time. And then um, within a few hours, we then get the Bank of England meeting. And then the uh, ECB meeting. Um, if we just look at the ECB meeting first, they are expected to hike rates by 50 basis points uh, to two and a half percent with markets pricing in uh, chances of that around 90 percent. So uh, nailed on, really. ECB speakers have been broadly hawkish um, uh, and even the most hawkish ones actually have hinted um, at probably uh, multiple 50 basis point moves rather than another 75 basis point hike. Um, if we cast our minds back to December, that meeting, President Lagarde stated that based on the information that we have available today, that predicates another 50 basis point rate hike at our next meeting and possibly at the one after that and possibly thereafter. So um, that's really what sort of markets have, have now priced in the statement. Um or consensus at least as sort of coalesced around that idea of a 50 basis point hike for this meeting. And then um, um, uh, ECB officials speaking have done really nothing to lead markets away from that view, even though we had sort of that uh, slight volatility. If you remember with the Bloomberg article a couple of weeks ago saying that there was consideration for a 25 basis point hike in March, but uh, we then had uh, a lot of speakers, actually a lot of ECB officials really knocking that back um, and, and preferring then another uh, 50 basis point hike in March. Um, so uh, market pricing has about 150 basis points of rate hikes priced in uh, until around mid-year. So that includes the 50 basis point hike, as we said. Um, that would keep actually the ECB now as the most hawkish 
uh, major central bank, um, which is quite a turn up for the books. If you remember, if you go back to, say, October, September last year, very, very pessimistic around the eurozone. If you remember uh, around energy prices, of course, uh, and that then has now turned around sharply. Um, the peak then, the peak rate uh, for the ECB for eurozone rates would be around three and a half percent. That's where markets have it currently. Uh, that's the first time actually uh, where we've been pricing in that today, uh, actually first time since January 2011. Um, so a 50 basis point hike in March. Um, so the next meeting from uh, this week's, that's given a high chance around above 80 percent, I think, last time I looked. Um, and it all potentially reduces the scope. Potentially, does it reduce the scope of a hawkish surprise? Um, some saying um, for, sorry, stepping back to this meeting. Um, certainly, if we get more details about QT, quantitative tightening, uh, and there's an appetite potentially to rein in the balance sheet at a faster clip, then, then that would be uh, more hawkish than expected. And that would certainly push the euro to new cycle highs. Um, but generally, President Lagarde is expected to be hawkish, um, say there is more work to do. And now really is not the time to take uh, the foot off the, pes uh, the pedal. Um, and again, it's all about messaging. Um, I should have said, actually, uh, to kick off the whole webinar, uh, this week is probably more about um, what central bankers, what they say rather than what they do, because um, uh, in the near term, at least, uh, pricing for these hikes is pretty much nailed on uh, for the Fed, for the ECB, and also for the Bank of England. So um, it's what they say, it's what President Lagarde says, is what um, Chair Powell says in his press conference, um, and where potentially ter the terminal rate is, how much more work um, the market thinks they have to do, how much more work they say they have to do in raising rates. Um, presuming the Fed is much closer to the top than the ECB, who still uh, will continue with 50 basis point rate hikes uh, for the foreseeable future, at least this meeting, next meeting. Um, and then that would take us to um, 3% and needing uh, another half percent or so of rate hikes after the March meeting still. Um, so euro dollar should kind of all underpin support. That is what is um, seen anyway. That is what is expected from this meeting at the ECB meeting on Thursday, that there's an underpinning of support for the euro. Um, just before the meeting, actually, we do get Eurozone CPI on Wednesday. Uh, that's uh, the headline anyway is expected to fall to 9% from 9.2% due to, again, falling energy prices. But the core, which is... Um, what everybody should concentrate on. The ECB concentrates on it um, far more, and they historically have far more than uh, the headline rate, uh, and that's seen remaining at 6.9%. Uh, so that just really highlights the issues that uh, confront ECB policymakers with um, the stickiness of uh, the core print. Um, Euro dollar then chart technically um, we were closing in on uh, last week's high that's at 109.29 um, and again you can see a slight bid to um, the euro against the dollar if we just look at the weekly actually we can see um, broad trend dy dynamics sorry they are relatively constructive still you can see from the lows a uh, decent rebound uh, and really kind of corrections should be limited in that sense because um, still bullish momentum, even though we're so, and that's sort of um, shown up actually in that RSA I, I, that you can see there, which is getting towards overbought territory. So bullish momentum still, um, and this really, again, potentially looks like bullish consolidation. So the opposite of obviously of that DXY chart, um, especially if we can push above sort of 109.42, which is the halfway point of uh, last year's or 21, sorry, 2021 decline down to those lows seen last year in September. So the halfway point of that move is at 
uh, 109.42. So a big resistance level there potentially. And then you've got sort of the 100 week moving average at 110.71 potentially. Um, otherwise, support in euro dollars, probably near term support 108.37 and then 107.66.36 or so as we see it. Uh, okay, um, Bank of England rate decision. Just pull up the cable chart. Um, but again, markets were slightly, they were slightly more mixed, around 75% probability of a 50 basis point hike, uh, and then 25 basis, uh, sorry, 25% chance of a 25 basis point hike. So a smaller, that's kind of, I think, being more priced out now. So it's more nailed on that we get a 50 basis point hike. Um but there is the potential, certainly for a split vote, um, given that two voters last time they wanted unchanged rates. Um, yeah, last time in December. Um, um, so the bar for a surprise is higher, probably uh, likely comes with a revision in inflation forecasts. Uh, a sleep, steeper than expected cut in inflation forecasts would, uh, which could turn negative in 2025 that could mean then a sooner than expected end to the bank of england's tightening cycle and that would potentially weigh on gbp weigh on sterling uh, and certainly inflation is set to fall more rapidly than expected which could help contain inflation expectations in a more acceptable range. Uh, overall, we do get these forecasts and the updated forecasts are expected to display, display a milder recession. Um, certainly a 25 basis point hike would obviously be a step down in the size of moves that we have seen um, and would probably need uh, or be accompanied by guidance that rates still have further to run um, given the developments in the labor market, recent developments, certainly uh, the job market remains tight. Uh, unemployment is near record lows and wages are uh, still growing at record place now at 7.2% uh, was the last print. Um, and again, even though we've seen this downtick really in the headline inflation, um, services inflation, which is probably a better measure of underlying domestic price pressures that actually accelerated last time. So in December. So uh, that all kind of needs to be borne in mind with policymakers sort of looking to um, crack on um, or, or get a handle on obviously <coughs> elevated uh, price pressures, inflation pressures. Um, so looking beyond February, um, a 25 basis point hike in March is priced around 80 percent um, with markets split on whether a further 25 basis point hike would follow in Q2. That would take the terminal rate to four and a half percent. And again, it's around guidance, uh, around guidance from the MPC, around guidance from Governor Bailey about uh, this end rate and what, um, if any, we see comments on that. Um, the outlook really, it's kind of less gloomy than, than it was, um, or was expected only three months ago. Um, as we said, a shallower recession probably be seen in the forecasts. Um, uh, and it, certainly if we do then possibly get a cooling in the labor market, um, then that could lead, uh, certainly to the MPC contemplating that end to the tightening cycle. Um, uh, so for cable, you can see a uh, really decent rebound course from those lows. Um, uh, but we are battling against this area in now. Push again chart. We can see it kind of looks like, sorry about this, um, just taking its time to reload um but again it kind of looks like bullish consolidation um yeah you can see there sort of one week consolidating around the highs um potentially then um in line with the dominant long-term trend that is then potentially we push up uh higher to the next obvious target that's probably 126.59 66 um uh in cable but uh yeah Tracking sideways means longer we have narrower ranges, the more likely we will get range expansion. Uh, and as I've said, 
historically that is in line with the long-term trend, which is for higher prices. Uh, but certainly more uh, as ranges uh, tighten, then uh, we should expect um, strong volatility uh, and range expansion after this sort of period of uh, tight ranges. Okay, finally, uh, we do get uh, non-farm payrolls on Friday, uh, always a key report for markets, of course. Uh, the monthly U.S. employment figures market looking markets looking for 175,000 jobs to be created in January. Uh, range of forecasts are, I think around 120 to 300,000. So uh, certainly a slower pace than the prior 223,000. Um, the three month average is 247, I think. Uh, the six month average 307. So slower pace of rate. Uh, sorry, slow pace of job gains, but certainly still decent. Um, unemployment rate forecast to tick up to 3.6%. Um, and much focus certainly will be on the average hourly earnings. Uh, they sent down from 4.6%. 4 uh, that would be the lowest year on year pace since August 2021. But the Month on month reading is still rising um, at 0.3%, so matching the December rate. Uh, with policymakers fixated, of course, on reducing inflationary pressures, then uh, uh, average hourly earnings will be a key focus. Um, if we get a number, say, below 4.2%, then we should see a solid rally in stocks in gold, potentially, and in risk FX, so Aussie dollar, Kiwi dollar, um, CAD potentially. Um, and then on the flip side, if we get a print above, say, 4.5%, uh, sort of 0.4% on the monthlies, even that would really send um, the dollar higher, uh, be positive for the greenback. Uh, um, and, yeah, uh, as well, on that wage growth, average hourly earnings. Uh, other labour market gauges, they continue to point to tight conditions. The weekly initial jobless claims that coincided with um, the same data, um, sorry, uh, which coincides with the same data window, actually. Um, that declined um, versus the comparable week for the December data. So, um, yeah, non-farm payrolls to wrap up the week, a really hectic week, of course, for um, for markets. Um, uh, so please follow us on social media and also our daily market commentary on uh, the website um, for a sort of probably more in-depth look at each of those um, risk events, certainly um, with um, kicking off really with um, the Fed meeting on Wednesday. OK, um, lots of risk events. So do um, uh just check your position sizes going into some of these risk meetings because volatility is expected for sure. Okay, take care out there and uh, we'll speak to you next week.